Uh, before we get started here with the intelligence panel, we have an announcement. Uh, someone borrowed a color poster from the JFK assassination fascination booth. Uh, whoever borrowed that uh, has to return it. It was only for a display. Um, the history mystery booth poster. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody this afternoon to what I think is going to be a fascinating panel. We have some folks who uh, have never spoken uh, about this subject in the United States before. We're going to shed some light on some interesting uh, developments in the intelligence area. Um, as most of you know, the Kennedy case has been rumored over the years to have fingerprints of intelligence all over it. Well, it hasn't been rumored. It does have the fingerprints of intelligence all over it. And the, the, it's hard to get to the bottom of this to, to find out what is myth, what is reality, what just looks suspicious, and so forth. You all know the problems. We have uh, assembled a terrific panel today to uh, shed light on these uh, difficulties here and give you some insights into their own experiences. Um, I think we're going to start today. W what I'll do is introduce the, all the participants and give you their backgrounds, and then they will uh, do a 25-minute uh, presentation. After all the presentations are finished, we'll do a, a panel discussion. We'll have some discussion up here between, among the panelists, and then we will uh, take question and answers. There will be a break, of course, at 4 o'clock. Um, today we have with us speaking will be John Newman, most of you are familiar with John Newman. The, he's, he's the assistant professor of history at my old alma mater, the University of Maryland. You, you, most of you know him as uh, the author of JFK in Vietnam, which provided a lot of the historical background for Oliver Stone's JFK. He's now working on his newest uh, venture into Kennedy and Cuba. He provided a lot of intelligence analyzing for the recent Frontline special in which he had made some major discoveries in the new documents at the National Archives. We also have today Peter Dale Scott, who needs no introduction here, I don't think. His most recent book, Deep Politics. He is a, I'm sorry, Deep Politics and the Death of JFK. Um, I think it's his, the best summary of his uh, expertise is that he has a way of dealing with the interconnections and linkages of uh, the main players in uh, the deep politics in the country and showing their interconnections and how they may play a role in various nefarious activities. We also have with us today William Turner, former FBI agent, uh, retired, author of The Fish is Red, later titled Deadly Secrets, and Hoover's FBI. And we have today uh, Mark Zaid, a young attorney from Washington, D.C., specializing in freedom of information uh, suits, and uh, he's going to be talking about the defection, fake defector program, if there was one, if there wasn't one. Uh, and finally, we have, uh, we're very honored to have, for the first time, Oleg Nechaparenko, retired KGB colonel. He was assigned to the Soviet Embassy in Mexico City in the 1960s. His new book is entitled Passport to Assassination. He also appeared on the recent Frontline program, uh, talking about his experiences with Lee Harvey Oswald in Mexico City. His Mexico experiences will be part of a later panel, I think, this evening. Today he will talk about the uh, general philosophy of the KGB dealings with defectors and how they dealt with Oswald in particular. We also have with us Ludmila paris Vitiova. Uh, she was uh, the political organizer for the uh, foreign delegations to the USSR. She worked as a developer for Soviet German governmental programs, uh, and she will talk about Oswald in Minsk. So I'd like to start uh, by turning it over to Bill Turner, who will talk about Lee Harvey Oswald's possible relationship with the CIA. Bill Turner. Thank you, Gus. Uh, on a uh, social note, I've been on panels with most of uh, the panelists before, but uh, Colonel uh, Nekaparenko is uh, new to me, and it's uh, maybe ironic, maybe a uh, uh, symbol of the times, but when he was a colonel with the KGB uh, down in Mexico City, attached to the Soviet embassy down there, I was an FBI agent in California specializing in counter-espionage. 
And uh, believe me, we had tremendous professional respect for the KGB, and I'm sure we didn't find all their illegal agents. <laughs> A couple. On the uh, subject of Oswald and intelligence, uh, I, I know a lot of people say Oswald and intelligence is an oxymoron, uh, but it's simply uh, not true. Uh, he's been portrayed as being somebody uh, very unstable, uh, very erratic, uh, no telling what he's going to do next uh, type of individual, but as a matter of fact, uh, he was a highly intelligent individual despite his um, problems, almost dyslectic with the written word. When it comes to Oswald, uh, we have two schools of thought predominantly now. Uh, Professor Blakely of the House Assassinations Select Committee uh, came to the conclusion that uh, if there was a conspiracy and certainly Oswald was somehow involved in it, either as a pawn or as a participant. If there was a conspiracy, uh, the prime motivation, the clout, the organization, the money, the supervisor level came from the U.S. Mafia. Uh, that, of course, was down Blakey's line of expertise since he has specialized in the Mafia through his teaching career. Uh, on the other side, uh, there was Jim Garrison, the district attorney in New Orleans. And uh, I should point out that uh, Jim was a close friend of mine. I worked very closely with him. Uh, I was a credentials carrying district attorney investigator in New Orleans for Jim. Uh, he felt that the intelligence fingerprints were all over the case. Uh, but he felt that it was a CIA operation all the way. Uh, at the same time, he, he didn't introduce evidence uh, which would point at the mafia. Uh, my own uh, conclusion is, after all these years of research, uh, sorting out fact from fancy, is that, and I say this as an investigator for 40 years, 10 years with the FBI, and on my own since then, uh, I've written numerous articles for the legal press and police science subjects. Sorting through this, uh, it seems quite apparent to me that the sponsorship came right out of the alliance between the mafia and the CIA, which began during World War II uh, when the CIA negotiated de a devil's pact with the Mafia in order to protect the docks in New York from sabotage, uh, they would let uh, Lucky Luciano go to Italy when the war ended. And since that time, there has been collaboration and operations of mutual interest between the agency and the, C and the, and the U.S. Mafia. Uh, first, I, I want to point out something because when you're dealing with intelligence, you're, you're talking a wilderness of mirrors. Uh, it's, it's an Alice in Wonderland. What, what appears to be isn't always what it is. And for that reason, as you know, if, if you've read anything on this case, if you've read anything about um, espionage literature, you know that there's agents, double agents, and uh, triple agents in some instances. And I want to point out that there are cells within cells in the CIA. There are rogue operations that take place without the knowledge of the civilian leadership and take place with perhaps only a small fraction of the personnel of the agency even having any knowledge of it. Uh, recently, I came upon a memorandum that I think is very illuminatory about how the CIA is really unaccountable because here was a situation in which the CIA could not even account to itself. I'm indebted to uh, Peter Cross of Back Channels for this document. It's a document that was furnished to the House Select Committee by the CIA. And if you recall back in uh, around 19, this is a 1967 memorandum. If you recall, back around that time, there started to appear in print references to the CIA 
and the mafia being involved in attempts to kill Fidel Castro. Uh, they started to ooze out uh, through Jack Anderson and Drew Pearson's column. Uh, they had been approached by the attorney for Johnny Rosselli, who was trying to buy himself a deal to avoid deportation after he had been convicted in the Friars Club scandal in Beverly Hills. And this particular document dated 25 April 1967 and authored by the Inspector General of the CIA reveals how operations are not reduced to paper. And I'm going to read a couple of excerpts just to give you a feel for what was going on. This reconstruction of agency involvement and in plans to assassinate Fidel Castro is at best an imperfect history because of the extreme sensitivity of the operations being discussed or attempted, as a matter of principle, no official records were kept of planning, of approvals, or of implementation. The few written records that do exist are either largely tangential to the main events or were put on paper from memory years afterwards. Uh, William Harvey, who was one of the agencies, prime movers, very active in the uh, attempts to assassinate Castro, the man who created what was called the executive action capability of the CIA, meaning assassination. Um, it says that William Harvey has retained skeletal notes of his activities during the years in question, and they are our best sources of date. But, it goes on to say, uh, although fragmentary records of the Technical Services Division are a help in establishing critical time frames. Operational files are useful in some instances because they give dates of meetings, the, subject, the substances of which may be inferred from collateral information. For the most part, though, we have had to rely on information given to us orally by people whose memories are fogged by time. Now, this is the CIA trying to account to itself about activities that went on, clandestine operations that went on, and they had no paper trail at all to go by. Uh, that's why I would caution that now that we're getting information out of the various intelligence agency files, that there's not going to be any smoking gun document in there. Anything that would be construed as a smoking gun either never existed on paper or long ago went in an Ali Nor shredder. It's not going to be there. These type of operations, especially when they involved assassination, were always handled by indirection. For example, one of the CIA executives saying, who will rid me of this turbulent priest? And that is a call to action. Uh, these kind of code words were very built into the agency. They remain that way today. Any operative in the agency knows what is meant when these type of cryptic words are uttered. Um, so having uh, taken the CIA's own account that there was no account, uh, I'd, I'd like to go on to Oswald and uh, what I believe was his intelligent role, intelligence role. Now, we're, we're talking two sections here. We're talking of the period in which he was in the Soviet Union and there's been some suspicion that he may have been either a KGB agent or a CIA agent during that period of time. I think recent revelations coming from the former KGB officials themselves makes it very clear that the KGB never considered recruiting him as an agent, although they did, they did keep uh, tabs of him. Uh, the idea of Oswald as a CIA agent, again, gets into that kind of circular world where certainly he was never on the CIA payroll. He never went to the farm in Williamsburg, Virginia, which is their training academy and tradecraft, the, the skills of the uh, secret agent, if you want to call it that. But again, there are types of agents. Uh, I, for example, uh, in, in doing Deadly Secrets, a, a prime source was a young man who was, came, he was an orphan. The CIA likes orphans. Uh, they like people like Oswald from dysfunctional families where nobody's really going to be screaming and yelling, where is he? 
this young man was involved during the 60s in some anti-Castro attempts out of Guatemala, uh, including the attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro. Uh, I ran into him afterwards, and uh, he started telling me about what had gone on and the fact that he felt like such an unperson. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, uh, he pulls out a clipping, a wire service clipping that shows that he went down at sea and was never found. Uh, that wiped out his uh, particular identity for the anti-Castro operations. That man no longer existed, but he had a problem with getting his own identity back. He was never a contract agent even for the CIA. He was paid simply on a per diem basis. Uh, you will find nothing on paper concerning this man, nor would you find anything on paper concerning Lee Harvey Oswald if, in fact, uh, he was a CIA operative. Now, getting even further into this, the, the, the handler of Oswald, or any agent on that level, um, might simply not even let it be known that he is from the CIA. He may pose as somebody entirely different. So we're talking then, again, a wilderness of mirrors. It's, it's kind of like who's on first, who's on second, no, what's on first. Um, Oswald's background is particularly helpful in, in coming to some kind of an idea of what his role was. He was with the, uh, uh, na with the Marine Corps at the Atsugi Naval Station in Japan, which was a U-2 facility. Um, he had access to information about the U-2. That was a classified document in the archives. And uh, he was uh, given such a high clearance that when he made his kind of putative defection to the Soviet Union, uh, the Navy had to change its codes in the Pacific. Uh, that was the level of trust in which he had been placed in, in, the, um, in the military service. Uh, again, how did he acquire any kind of proficiency in the Russian language? Uh, Warren reports spread the fiction that he was self-taught and Oswald himself uh, mentioned to acquaintances that he had studied Russian at Tulane University. But as a matter of fact, he was speaking Russian while he was in the Marine Corps, and it seems entirely likely that he was tutored in the language for a specific purpose while he was in the service. Uh, Marine Corps records reflect that on February 25th, 1959, at the conclusion of his Atsugi tour of duty, he was given a Russian proficiency test. So obviously he had acquired by that time some type of language ability in that language. Former Marine comrade Kerry Thornley uh, said that he conversed in Russian with John Rene Heindel every morning at muster. Uh, going to Oswald's defection to the Soviet Union, and the other panelists will be getting into this in some depth, but I. I do want to uh, mention a couple things about it. Uh, he arrives in Moscow and promptly uh, decides that he wants to renounce his U.S. citizenship and become a Russian citizen. By this time, uh, he had erected a trail of, of being very pro-Marxist uh, and professed himself to be a uh, friend of the Soviet Union. And so uh, he goes to Mr. Snyder the, uh, in the U.S. Embassy and says he wants to renounce his citizenship. He then goes to the Soviets and wants to become a Soviet citizen. Uh, in turn, the Soviets, being very suspicious of him and where he's coming from in terms of who he was really working for, uh, deported him or gave orders of deportation. Uh, the next thing we know, we have a little guerrilla theater in the form of Oswald slashing his wrist, a uh, apparent attempted suicide, which allowed him to stay in the Soviet Union. And at that point, he was given uh, a job in Minsk, and uh, Ludmilla will be talking about that, uh, and remained there for several years until he decided uh, to exit the Soviet Union and uh, become a uh, defector back to the United States, so to speak. Uh, 
one of the real interesting things I find real interesting is that when he got back to, the, to this area, to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, he found a job at Jagger's Charles Stowall Company in Dallas, uh, a photographic uh, firm that had very many army contracts, classified army contracts, and here's this man who had been a defector to the Soviet Union working in this place. Uh, he also conversed with another employee of the company by the name of Dennis Ofstein, and uh, Ofstein had some Russian language ability. Apparently that set Oswald to talking about all the time I was in Minsk, Ofstein quotes him as saying, all the time I was in Minsk, I never saw a vapor trail. Now to me, that suggests a possibility, he was looking to see if the overflying U-2s from Turkey to Norway were leaving vapor trails visible to Soviets uh, as they flew over the Minsk area. Further, he also mentioned, according to Ofstein, about the disbursement of Soviet military units, saying that they didn't intermingle their armored divisions and inf infantry divisions and various units the way we do in the United States, and they would have all of their aircraft in one geographical location and their tanks in another geographical location and their infantry in another. Um, then on one occasion, Oswald asked Ofstein to enlarge a photograph taken in Russia, which he explained represented some military guards, some military headquarters, and that the guards stationed there were armed with weapons and ammunition and orders to shoot any trespassers. Uh, I submit that what we're talking about here is not the, a man who was simply in the Soviet Union uh, for political defection reasons. Obviously, he was up to something, and the question is, on whose behalf was he doing all this? Uh, after the assassination, the Dallas County Deputy Sheriffs went out to Irving where Marina Oswald was living, and they confiscated uh, Oswald's property that had been left there. Among his property, was sophisticated optical equipment, such as a stereo realist camera, a Hansa camera timer, filters, a small German camera, a Wollensack 15 power telescope, a Micron 6 power binoculars, and a variety of film. Now, the small German camera is this one. You probably all have heard of a Minox. And this was created by the Germans specifically for intelligence purposes. It has little knobs here, so when you're photographing documents, you know how far away from the document to stand as to your focus. And it's not something that somebody would take to a Sunday school picnic. Uh, what was Oswald doing with this sophisticated piece of camera gear? Uh, was this the type of camera with which he took the photographs of the Soviet military deployments and installations. These are questions, of course, that we're going to have to try to get at uh, further as John goes through CIA files and uh, others and try and get an answer to just what his status was in the Soviet Union. So when he comes back, Oswald again is into this situation of being a visible left winger. Uh, he goes down to New Orleans in the summer of 1963 and he's parading on the streets. He establishes a rump chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, which is very pro-Castro, and uh, otherwise carries on as if he's very interested in promoting Fidel Castro the Communist Party, and various other American far-left organizations. Uh, I have an egg timer at my side here. Gus is indicating I've got to speed it up, and uh, I will do that. Uh, I, I think that the nut on what Oswald was up to in New Orleans and up to the assassination uh, lies in the 544 Camp Street address. 
uh, as early as January of 1961, when Oswald was still in the Soviet Union, three men, two of them Cuban, one Anglo, appeared at the Bolton Ford Company in New Orleans. They wanted to order trucks for an outfit called the Friends of Democratic Cuba. And the two Cubans made sure that the, as the Oscar de Salt, the uh, manager there recalls, and he actually pulled out a slip of paper, uh, that Leon Oswald signed for it because he is the official with the Friends of Democratic Cuba that's authorized to do so. The Friends of Democratic Cuba were headquartered at 544 Camp Street. That's the address that Oswald had on some of his literature that he handed out in the streets of New Orleans then when he got in the scuffle uh, with Carlos Bringier. Uh, that is when they found that he had that address stamped on 544 Camp Street. The other entrance, the side entrance to that building, uh, up to the second floor, is the entrance to the, all of the Cuban exile groups sponsored by the CIA at that time. It was kind of a grand central station for Bay of Pigs activities. They operated the training camps on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain that were used to train assassination and paramilitary outfits. And the head man up there was Guy Bannister, ex-FBI official, who was with the uh, Office of Naval Intelligence, the CIA, and an outfit uh, called the Friends of Democratic Cuba, among other right-wing organizations. It was out of that office that a assassination plot was hatched against uh, General de Gaulle in France, and actually uh, he was caught in a crossfire but escaped. $100,000 was sent from that location. So here's Oswald, and testimony ties him in with it, uh, with 544 Camp Street, as well as the documentary evidence, a testimony coming from Delphine Roberts, uh, from David Lewis, and other people who themselves were active in that little venue. Uh, I've run out of time. So what I would like to sum up is the novel uh, by Eric Ambler called A Coffin for Demetrius, and the Turkish police inspector is saying the important thing to know about assassinations is not who fired the gun, but who paid for the bullets. Thank you. Bill Turner. Next up, let me introduce once again, uh, speaking on Oswald in Minsk, Ludmila Pires Vyatova. So I just would like to mention first how, <clears throat> how it happened that I started this, uh, can I move closer? Thank you, thank you. How, it, uh, uh, how the whole thing started that I was involved into this project, and um, Lee Harvey Oswald and Kennedy became the subject of my research. And I would like to mention that first, the name Kennedy was in my life when I was a teenager in a small Ukrainian town, 27, I think, years ago in November. I was 16 years old, and uh, in mass media and everywhere, there was news that Kennedy was assassinated. And as far as, as far as I remember, all women in my small town ran to small shops, and you can see long lines of women who were sure that the Third World War will start as the Second World War, and what you need is salt, sugar, and matches. Then I remember, for some reason, the whole thing quietened, and the problem was solved. Then, in November 1991, when I was in Moscow and worked as a counselor on international issues for the Soviet government, for the Minister of Education, there was a phone call into my apartment, and Larry Schiller said to me, I'm going to send you a fax, and it's very important. Just read it and answer. So I received the fax. And in effect, it was said, 
Ludmila Norman Mela and I are coming to Russia, and we would like you to introduce us to the chairman of KGB, Mr. Bakatin, and we would like to have an exclusive access to KGB files. Thank you. As simple as that. So I read these facts, and um, well, I decided to try. I decided uh, to try, and since that, since that moment, I became involved into this research. We, Norman Miller and Larry Schiller, and I, we came, they mostly they came to Russia. And uh, since that time, since uh, November 1991, I started to work and started to know about Lee Harvey Oswald 12, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. Mostly it includes Moscow period and Minsk period. Norman Miller is going to write a book, so I don't want and I cannot really be a person who can talk too much about the whole Minsk period. But I think there are certain things which I can mention. And um, mostly, as we are here talking about defectors, it's not a good one? Is it, does it work? Is it better? Mm -hmm. I, I hear it, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> So, as you know, um, maybe that Russian defectors were never desirable in Russia. Uh, excuse me, foreign defectors were never desirable in Russia. They usually caused a lot of problems, and the government and the Communist Party were doing their best not to accept any foreign defector unless there was real big political reason. And one of the most political reasons was usually some kind of recommendation or assistance from any kind of political party which was approved by the government or the Communist Party of any country in the world. So just to be a defector in the Soviet Union was to prove you deserve it. When Lee Harvey Oswald came to Russia, there was nothing which proved he deserves to stay there. And according to some information we got from the files in Moscow, it was clear that some experiences Russian the Russian, the Soviet government had before with the defector, with the defectors was just a headache. So mostly people who came as defectors, not on political reasons, and even sometimes on political reasons, were disappointed and wanted to come back. And from the political and propagandistic point of view, it was not something the government desired. So after, uh, after debriefing in a certain way of Lee Harvey Oswald, it was clear that he is not a real Marxist-Leninist, and it was clear that there is no any real political active background uh, of his which he could be acceptable. So uh, Lee Harvey also had really had a big problem to get not only Soviet citizenship, but just to stay on a, perm on a um, temporary residence. Um, what happened was that KGB completely refused to give him any type of political assignment in the country. But uh, the whole political situation at this time, especially because the visit of the president was expect of the president of America was expected in Russia, the propagandistic department of the Communist Party of Politburo didn't want to have a problem with a young American who came for some type of experiences and tried to commit a suicide and is going to be sent back, though his desire to, start to stay and learn what the socialist system is, is so great. Um, uh, life is sometimes is more exciting and interesting than books. So what was very interesting about this situation was that Mikoyan, who was the Deputy Prime Minister of the Soviet Union personally took part in the, this type of decision making, allowing Lee Harvey Oswald to stay as a resident for one year in the Soviet Union. And later on, as we were making the research, <coughs> it was <coughs> very interesting that Mikoyan was a person who was 
sent by the Russian, by the Soviet government to America when Kennedy was assassinated to represent, to represent the Soviet Union. And uh, which we found out too, and it was very interesting research that <clears throat> at this time, when many people from different countries came to America to show respect and sadness of their own people and the governments what happened in America, at this period of time, another person in Moscow was going to the airport to accompany Mikoyan. He was a cameraman who had a special permission of the government to film very important delegations and very important political events. And this young man was as scared as maybe nobody else in the world. Because this young man was the man where Lee Harvey Oswald and Marina stayed last night in Moscow. So this man was now going to the, to the airport to film Mikoyan going to the funerals of uh, Kennedy. And as his colleague said to him, don't you think it's your last job? So this was something I know Norman is going to write. I don't know if he's going to write about that. <laughs> but I, I think that Norman is going to write uh, a lot of things which will be um, new to everybody and which will uh, give a different, a different understanding what was going on with Lee Harvey Oswald in Russia and which formed Lee Harvey Oswald psychology in Russia and how people in Russia uh, treated Lee Harvey Oswald, how they reacted to the defectors in Russia and how it worked out for Lee Harvey Oswald later. So Lee Harvey Oswald was sent to Minsk and um, Minsk was just the right place for him. Minsk was a place where KGB was the most experienced and the KGB was one of the most conservative. And the Minsk was not a place where you can get any real important military information, though there were some places where it might be of some interest. Uh, being defector in Russia, in Moscow, or Leningrad, or is now it's in St. Petersburg, is one thing. But being a foreigner and defector in some provincial place like Minsk is, a, is quite difficult and unusual experience from any person and any young man from a Western country. Of course, Lee Harvey Oswald was <clears throat> observed and watched by KGB every day every minute of his life, and um, we managed to get an, an access to some information which will help to restore what really happened, because documents are really the most important thing in 30 years which proves the truth. I remember when we were discussing <clears throat> and interviewing so many people in Minsk, and people were trying to go back to what happened 30 years ago. I remember Norman said that, you know, sometimes memory is something you want to remember. You are honest, you're telling the truth, but it doesn't mean you remember everything. So I think that we were lucky enough to have both. People who were still alive and remembered everything, but what they remember might be a part of the truth, and at the same time we had some and, and access to some unique things which proved or sometimes direct us to certain ideas or interpretations of what really happened. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald in Minsk uh, had um, a very exciting and privileged life. Um, he was privileged in everything. He even married one of the most beautiful women in Minsk. And, um, he married a woman whom many men were attracted. He was uh, popular, popular just because he was American. He was desirable in any social level. He could come to any community, which sometimes is not easy in any European country and in a conservative country like Russia. 
if you are a worker at the radio factory, there are not so many chances that professors or academicians or people of high level society will accept you home and want to talk to you and have a cup of coffee. But if you're just the only American, they would like to do it. So he was privileged, he enjoyed his life on one side, and on the other side, he didn't. He was suspected to be a CIA agent, and uh, KGB was interested if he knows Russian, and if he pretends he doesn't know Russian, or he knows Russian and tries to show he doesn't. So, um, I think I just would like to tell a small episode, and then I think it's um, the only one with Norman permission, if you don't mind. <laughs> and, no, what, what I'm saying, it's my information. It's not what I say, but I think how you say it, okay? What I say is not, so, even Norman say, he will say it's just so intelligent and different that I am not even <laughs> afraid to say it. You know what was really interesting in our project was that <clears throat> Norman is uh, really a person who is very highly respected in the Soviet Union. I'm not flattering him, I'm just telling how it is. Russia is a country where writers, composers, and poets are highly respected and cons considered to be the elite. Even if you don't have, you can have no money, you can have uh, uh, even no you, have, you can have no social position, but if you are a writer, composer, a poet, you, can, you, you are very highly respected. Russians respect people who dare to think the way they want to think. But to think is one, th it, to think about something is easier than to write, to, to dare to write what you think. No one was considered to be a person who dares to write what he thinks. He was in Russian encyclopedia, and um, his name, of course, opened certain things which were not honestly opened without him. The president of Belarusia was flattered was flattered when Norman agreed and had time to meet with him for one hour. And uh, he gave an exclusive interview to Norman. And the exclusive interview was that the president of Belarus, Mr. Shushkevich, 32 years ago, was the teacher of Russian at the radio factory of, Norman, of Lee Harvey Oswald. And uh, it was... Uh, a very interesting and exciting news for us. Lee Harvey Oswald in Minsk had a very difficult time, especially when he married. And uh, when he wanted to go back, in fact, the government, as far as I know, was relieved. In a way, it was relieved that now there is a person in Belarus, American man, who can go back and there will be less headache and less money spent on his observation. So he left the country and uh, went to America. And as far as I remember, Marina, when she was invited for the last interview, was warned that she has the right to leave the country, but she has no right to come back. So this is the way it was at this period of time in the Soviet Union, the situation with all defectors. Thank you. Ludmila Perestvilva.
Uh, by way of a preface to our next speaker, uh, I'd like to say that uh, many of you know I was part of the Frontline Project that was on a couple days ago. <laughs> I get high on resentment. Uh, and uh, one of the things that didn't air, we did a lot of background research into many areas that didn't eventually make it onto the screen, and, and, and that's regretful because we, we did a lot of other work. Uh, one of the areas we looked very heavily into was this area of defectors and fake defectors. Uh, we spoke with many CIA, ONI um, officers who would be in a position to know if such a thing existed. We communicated with Otto Otepka, Victor Marchetti, who was one of the earliest references to this story of a fake defector. No, he's not. No. <laughs> Otto Otepka is alive, for those of you who weren't sure. Uh, Victor Marchetti and various others. We spent quite a bit of time and money to pursue this. Uh, seeing as it never aired the results of our study, uh, when Mark told me he was a panelist on this, um, this uh, panel, we let him incorporate our work into his. So what you're going to see when Mark speaks is mostly his prodigious efforts on this behalf, but also uh, a lot of the frontline uh, findings. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Mark Zaid. Thank you, Gus. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And this topic is, is such a mystifying, captivating one for all of us. And I, I think the, the one, good, one thing for me that I'm finally happy about being with the, on these panels that I noticed in the program, I'm finally not the youngest person that, that's speaking here. And that's always been an obstacle, so to speak. Uh, because the topic has been so captivating to us, I think, in a sense, it's clouded our judgments. We've all grown up sort of idolizing spies, uh, learned, learned of it in, in school, Nathan Hale, Mata Hari. Uh, we've all been influenced by Ian Fleming's James Bond and, and the like of that to, to see how spy work is pre with precision clockwork, uh, beautiful women, fanciful missions, incredible spy gadgets. And in some ways, when we try and compare that to reality, it just does not come true. And it's a hard image to fight with. And as I've been preparing for this, this particular panel, what I've done is try and trace back all the allegations of Oswald's intelligence connections back to their original sources. And I've done so through the Freedom of Information Act, through going through documents now that have been released through the National Archives or to the AARC, or talking to the the people who have actually been quoted in the, the many volumes. And uh, in, in that sense, we come to difficult findings. And, and, and Bill is correct. You know, there is no document that says there was a false defector program or that Oswald was an agent. And it's very well possible that you know, he could have been what, we, what people, I don't call, the intelligence community calls a dangle. He sent to the Soviet Union to see how the Soviets react. That was what one CIA agent told to me as a possibility, uh, not from any knowledge of his, but just as a, as a possibility. And in trying to examine the defector question and the Oswald question, since I fairly much realized I would not find anything directly on Oswald, I thought perhaps by examining other defectors to the Soviet Union or other com communist nations, there might be some sort of pattern or uh, similarities which we can use then to base our conclusions of Oswald. And in doing so, there are thus two questions that my remarks focus on. Did there exist a program among one or more intelligence agencies of the United States to conduct a false defector program to communist nations primarily during the 50s and 60s? And second, in a broader context, was Oswald some form of intelligent asset while he was there? And, and I must admit, the concept of a false defector program, I cannot believe that our agencies did not contemplate, if not implement, such a program. It, it just seems to make sense. We, we know, if, if you're familiar with our own CIA history and Russian defectors to the United States, Anatoly Galitsyn, Yuri Nosenko, that for sure we considered that the Soviets were sending us false defectors. So why, we would, why would we not consider it the other way around? And why, if, if someone such as myself or, or somebody in the audience who has no intelligence connection, regardless of what you think of me, that uh, how could, if we consider it, how could the professionals not consider it? But in doing so, in reviewing this, my conclusion can only be that there is absolutely no available evidence that there was a false defector program 
or that Lee Harvey Oswald was an intelligence asset prior to or during his time in the Soviet Union. And I do not, I restrict my remarks uh, to only until June of 1962. I do not cover the period of when he returned to the United States. So the question of whether he was some sort of FBI informant or, or whoever else uh, with going to Mexico City or infiltrating pro or anti-Castro groups, I leave that to uh, the other panels and, and all my other colleagues. So in examining the false defector question, well, what exists? Primarily, there are three main sources that have been held out amongst the volumes and the discussions I've had with, with researchers. The first was a comment made by Victor Marchetti, primarily to Tony Summers and his founding conspiracy, which essentially said that in 1959, ONI, Office of Naval Intelligence, was running a false defector program utilizing 30 to 40 young men who feigned disenchantment and then defected to the Soviet Union. Then according to Marchetti, quote, they were sent there with the specific intention the Soviets would pick them up and double them if they suspected them of being US agents or recruit them as KGB agents, end quote. And that program was run out of Nags Head, North Carolina. The second piece of evidence was that of the study conducted by Otto Otepka through the Department of State to determine whether or not US defectors to the Soviet Union were genuine or not. And the results of this study were never completed as it just so happened that right before he got to the Oswald fire, file, the files were removed from his office, he was thrown out, and it never got finished. And then the third final point was primarily that of Robert Webster, another American who defected to the Soviet Union, and then other known defectors that are, are not really uh, as, as much um, reviewed or such, Nicholas Petrulli, Libero Ricciardelli, and, and a few others. And after looking at this, I focused on all three, and I traced them as far back as I could. And what did that mean? It meant talking to these people. So I talked to Victor Marchetti. And Victor Marchetti, and, and a lot of this uh, information now was, was information that Frontline actually put together, and as Gus said, was not aired, and I went to confirm a lot of it and expounded on it. And Victor Marchetti states now, and you can certainly call him and check, he's in Virginia, he owns a, a magazine, that he never said that to Tony Summers. At least he never said it in such a definitive state. He said he heard about something of that sort. He heard about that after he had left the agency with the nags head. He thought it might be ONI because he knew ONI was involved with some sort of dirty tricks and they never told the CIA what they were doing. He heard about it because he thought from his experiences in the CIA something of that sort would be done. But in no way was the statement attributed to him a fact. It was his pure speculation. He had no hard evidence. And when I pushed him on it, he said, look, Oswald's time in the Soviet Union to me was just strange. And I don't know anything beyond that. Now, the Otepka thing is a lot more fascinating. And in talking to the man, he's as lucid, lucid as can be. He was in charge of the Office of Security in the Department of State for a number of years. That office was responsible for maintaining security, classified documents, classification of individuals, hiring of individuals, make sure that they were not being infiltrated or secrets being dispatched out to whomever, uh, whatever party. One thing, this study started in 1960 at the bequest of the uh, Bureau of Intelligence through the State Department to a request to the CIA. And in fact, this was one of the reasons why allegedly the CIA opened up its, defect, its 201 file on Oswald, which is a separate question as why it took so long. I, I think maybe John might go into that. But for one thing, Atepka wasn't in charge of it. It was a joint project between the two divisions. And although he did state that one of the things they would have looked at was whether or not a defector was genuine. He had noticed throughout the years there had been a number of defectors since World War II. And these defectors would un undoubtedly come into contact with State Department personnel, i.e. embassy personnel. And they were worried that some of these defectors might have compromised Department of State personnel. So the main purpose of this study was to examine what State Department personnel these defectors came in contact with to make sure they had not been compromised. The whole subject of his ouster is, is a difficult one, and it would take a whole conference in and of itself. It lasted 
the better part of a decade. He was ousted not because of this study, but because of ideological and political battles that were going on within the executive branch of the administration and the State Department and officials that Kennedy brought in that did not agree with Otepka and some of the other personnel. It had nothing to do with this file. Now, the one thing that I, I always wanted to ask him, and I finally got a chance, okay, you didn't get to Oswald. What about the other defectors? What were your results of their files? Were you able to come to any conclusions? They saw nothing. The files were pulled to them almost immediately. They were not able to review anybody. And he said if he would make any decision on it, it would be purely speculative. And I think most interestingly, when I asked him, well, when you first examined this, were you thinking about that there could have been false defectors, O and I, so to speak? And he said, you know, we never even thought about that. That wasn't on our minds. In fact, the first time that I heard about the possibility that this might have happened was when I read a book in 1992, which was JFK, the book of the film, and he saw in a footnote that O and I might have run a false defector program. And that footnote was solely attributed to the statement of Victor Marchetti, which I just discussed. Now the third one, the third point, is Robert Webster and the other defectors. And the House Select Committee reviewed all of these defectors. Uh, there were 380 persons that the CIA identified as possible defectors from 1958 to 1963. The, the House Select Committee requested 29 files of that. The 380, many of those were just tourists, people visiting relatives, uh, Communist Party members, things like that. Uh, of those 29, they eventually weeded it down to 11, primarily because either they were businessmen going back and forth, they were suspects in espionage cases as far as here, Communist Party members who fled for un-American activities of and, and sort, uh, people like uh, information they weren't allowed to see regarding Mitchell and uh, the other one I'm forgetting, Mitchell and Martin who were NSA defectors that uh, really caused a big stir uh, within the Congress, if, if you're familiar with that period. But of the 11, what they did is they examined how the KGB handled them, the similarities between them, where they were sent, what kind of money they were paid, uh, how they got their exit visas, because many of them returned, all these patterns. They came up with absolutely nothing. There was no consensus among them. There were only circumstantial similarities. There was just absolutely nothing. They came upon no evidence of anything of their being a false nature. Webster and Petrulli in particular, and Ricky Ardelli to a lesser extent, were of great interest to the FBI right after the assassination. In fact, Webster was interviewed by the Senate Internal Security Committee when he came back to the U.S. for two weeks almost. And those files, I think, are still sealed because the committee's files are still sealed. But the FBI interviewed Webster uh, to extensive deal. He said he never heard of Oswald except for the fact he heard someone else had defected. He never came into contact with him. Nothing of the sort. And I know there's been a rumor going around that Marina had indicated that Oswald had defected after uh, being at a, an exhibition, which was actually Webster's pattern. But I'm told after I asked of somebody to ask her that she denies ever making that comment. I, I don't know where that came from. Now, that's not to say categorically that none of these people were false defectors or anything of the sort, just that there is no publicly available evidence. By the way, Webster is still alive, but he's in a state, I, I'm told he suffered a stroke after he'd been tracked down, he cannot uh, converse with anybody, but I did talk to, one of, to some of his family members. They were adamant that he was there for nothing besides uh, sort of political reasons. He actually fell in love with a woman, Russian woman, and remained in the Soviet Union. They want nothing to do with him whatsoever. They actually thought it was kind of uh, imbalanced a little bit. So there was just nothing of a, of a false defector program, much as I would love to find one. I guess I'd be on Nightline and Larry King if I was able to find one, but I just, I didn't. Frontline. frontline. I would have been on Frontline, but I didn't, I just didn't find it. Like I said, it's not to say there's not. What I want to really go through is the allegations of Oswald being an agent. And let me list through them and give you what I believe to be explanations for many of those. And I certainly uh, would love to have comments on them and challenge me on any of them, it, or if you know of anything else that, that might indicate uh, those possibilities. And just as one more caveat, I talked to Richard Snyder, 
who you, many of you know was the embassy official that dealt with all of these. And he dealt with Petruli and Webster as well. And uh, when I just I asked him whether he thought there was any possibility of them being defectors or false defectors, and he said he in his dealings he just came across no indication that they were, and he wasn't aware of anyone discussing that that, that might have been a possibility. But let me go through what evidence there is that's been held out as Oswald being an intelligence agent within the Soviet Union and prior to, and what I think might explain it. And a lot of this comes from reviewing the original documentation, primarily State Department documentation, because they were the ones that were responsible for his time in the Soviet Union as far as keeping watch over him. Not that the CIA wasn't, but as far as when he was coming back and of the like, it was the State Department. And you'll see in the CIA file, most of their records actually originate from State. State would disseminate all their reports to the different agencies. And, and as John will talk about, the, uh, and I don't want to get into it, but it's really the failure of the CIA for the most part, not what they did that, that's been the problem, and, and John will go into that. The first point of information, and I'm sort of going to go in a chronological order, is the fact that Oswald contracted venereal disease, of all things, in the line of duty, not due to own misconduct. And that's been held as tantalizing evidence that Oswald was an intelligence asset. That is a legal determination which indicates Oswald filed proper procedure for reporting he contracted the disease, sought out the proper medical attention, and he is guaranteed to receive medical benefits for any problems that arise thereafter. And if that sounds strange, the very fact when he shot himself was also in the line of duty not due to own misconduct. You could commit a crime and be in the line of duty not due to own misconduct if you followed certain procedures, if you weren't AWOL, things like that. So there is just absolutely no basis uh, to that indicating that as far as he was, a, was an agent because of that determination. Another aspect would be the mysterious death of Martin Schrand, who was one of his comrades, so to speak, uh, at, 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 uh, in the Philippines, at Cubi, Cubi Point, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, and after the assassination, it was rumored by two of their fellow Marines that Oswald might have been partially responsible. In fact, Powers, Gary Francis Powers, even raised that contention. ONI investigated Schrand's death in 1958. They investigated it at the behest of the Warren Commission 64, and the FBI investigated it. I've reviewed at least what they've made public in all those files, and it does indica indicate that there's anything missing within those files, and it is clearly an accident in Schrand's death. And for that point, even if, if it wasn't, there has been absolutely no proof beyond the fact that rumors were heard that Oswald might have been responsible to indicate Oswald was anywhere near this person. Essentially, in a nutshell, Shran was, was known, had proclivity for playing with his weapon and doing a lot of the drills, and he banged the butt against the floor, uh, the, the, the ground, and it discharged. And even with the safety on, when they conducted tests of similar rifles, 30% of the time, the rifle discharged. And if you reviewed the evidence as to where he was shot, you would have had to have been lying on the ground looking up at him underneath his armpit to shot him. That was the trajectory of the bullet. The queen bee, whether or not Oswald was, was uh, hanging out in these establishments and he did not have the, the uh, amount of money that was possible, it would, it would be, what, 50 to $75, $60 to take out one of the hostesses because you had to pay for her time away from the establishment and Oswald was only making X amount of dollars per month, $81, $78, whatever. Uh, those, unfortunately, have never been substantiated. They came from one main source, a fellow Marine named Bucknell who was interviewed by Lane in the late 70s. The only thing I could say on that is that in, uh, people have talked to Bucknell's family and they consider him to be an absolute con man and uh, have not been able to find him uh, for years, don't want anything to do with him. And in talking to, I talked to Oswald's roommate, James Botello, who by the way says he was the best damn roommate and he ever had in his lifetime, uh, indicated that he did not trust Bucknell. Bucknell scared the living uh, bejeebses out of him, if I can say that in 1993, uh, and not to make anything of that. The radar codes, I know Bill mentioned it. It's true, they changed the radar codes on the West Coast. And the source of that comes from John Donovan, who was a lieutenant and one of Oswald's commanders or direct commanders. And if you, re if you read John Donovan's testimony, you find out 
that the radar codes were very frequently changed at random times just to maintain secrecy. That it was just a simple explanation, perhaps, that that, because of Oswald's defection and his possible knowledge of amount of aircraft, possible codes, and Donovan said he would be surprised if Oswald could have remembered any of these codes unless he actually wrote them down, because Donovan couldn't remember them, and he was a lieutenant, that they might just have changed it at that point. That was one of the random times where they would change it. Albert Schweitzer College has also been held out to be a possibility. And as you might know, Oswald had applied to attend school there and never showed up. And that caused two problems. It was a small Unitarian school in Chernwalden, Switzerland, that had only about 12 to 20 students at any time. And I talked to the reverend who ran it, his son. The reverend had passed away. Uh, he was interviewed by the Warren Commission, uh, and I spoke to his son about it. He laughed at any intelligence ties. The school had closed down. It wasn't open for a great deal of time, and they were surprised, actually, that that Oswald would even would apply there. There's never been any evidence of how he figured out or found out about this school. Uh, but he never showed up at the school, and that caused a second problem, particularly with the FBI. And you might recall there was a 1960 document by Hoover himself indicating that somebody might be using Oswald's birth certificate. And why that came about, God, time goes by fast, doesn't it? Why that came about was because his mother came to them with, ev with letters from Switzerland saying Oswald never showed up. And they were worried that somebody else might use his birth certificate because they weren't sure if it was the same person yet in Russia or Switzerland. And they wanted to make sure that nobody else was using the birth certificate. Not that somebody was using the birth certificate. Well, since I have five minutes, I'll run down things extremely quickly uh, as that might have been held out, the, I think, that have been really suspicious. Oswald's mother said, he was an agent. We've always looked at that suspiciously. If you read the actual statement that she made, she goes that her son, she's telling this to the FBI, that her son had in fact gone to the Soviet Union as a U.S. secret agent. And if this were true, she wished the appropriate authorities to know that she was destitute and should receive some compensation. I think that, that says it all there right, as to why she was doing that. The visa at the Soviet Union to get in. The State Department looked into it and found out that actually it could have happened that way. They had evidence of other Americans getting visas in as little as 24 hours from Stockholm to go into the Soviet Union. The fact that he was given his passport. He fit all the legal requirements. He never renunciated his citizenship. And in fact, they almost mailed his passport back to him when they said, no, for security reasons, we shouldn't do that. We'll make sure that he comes and gets it. And in fact, they decided they had to give it to him because without the passport, he could not demonstrate to the Russians he, ha he could get back to the United States. And that would facilitate his getting an exit visa to go back to the United States. The fact that he uh, might have given over secret information. He, to, under oath, told Snyder he never did. And they took it at face value as that. He said even if he uh, had been asked to, he wouldn't have. That was the only thing they could do to demonstrate whether or not he did. They weren't going to ask the Soviets if he did for, for obvious reasons. And in any way, the State Department felt it better to bring back disillusioned Americans who had defected to the Soviet Union, to bring them back to the U.S. because they felt they could do less damage within the United States than anywhere else. And in fact, the Soviets were glad to get rid of him because he was causing a lot of problem there. And that was one of the reasons why they gave uh, Marina her exit visa. Just get him out of our hair. Now, the other thing why they let him back in was because one, there was, and this was a big debate, they did not allow him back in very easily. There was a problem with Marina's exit visa. They didn't want to approve it. And they finally did because they felt if they did not allow him to come back in, the Soviets could use it as a propaganda tool to say, look, we're trying to keep the family together and the United States is not. And the United States felt that by not allowing him to come back in, that might jeopardize their attempts to get out true Soviet relatives of American citizens because the Soviets wouldn't want to deal with them uh, on, on a fair basis. Um, I'll rattle off things so if you can ask me about. There are explanations for the lookout card and why there wasn't any lookout card as far as giving his passport back. There was explanations for uh, his travel to the U.S. I'm going to say final three things because this is just, it's just, I found this, this is just too voluminous to go through. So three final things. 
Oswald stated in New Orleans that he was under the protection of the United States government, and we've always been incredibly intrigued by that. Where did that come from? This is speculation, of course. But in a State Department telegram back to the United States from the Moscow Embassy, the last question is, does the, state, does the department consider that Oswald is entitled to the protection of the United States government while he continues to reside abroad under present circumstances in the absence of reasonable evidence that he has committed an expatriating act? My suspicion would be that he got that language right from the embassy itself, that because he didn't give up his citizenship, he was technically under the protection of the United States government. And that's where he got that exact same language. Second. The fact that his passport did not reflect he passed over from East Germany to West Germany at Helmstead. Marina's does. Why? Little June Oswald's passport doesn't indicate that either. Was she a spy? No. The West Germans very, very rarely noted Americans coming into West Germany. There was no reason for it. They always did indicate if there were members of the communists from the communist nations coming in. Finally, the Rotterdam escapade. Marina said, stated she stayed at an apartment, and that's always been suspicious. Whose private apartment did she stay at? Now, I have no idea what this means. This needs to look into. Maybe somebody knows about it. But I found a State Department document, undated and unnamed, that reviewed the cost of traveling for Oswald to get back to the United States. And they looked at three routes. And one of the routes was Moscow, Brussels, Rotterdam, which was more expensive. And they said, although the detour by Brussels cost a little more, I believe the added convenience of the ready-made shelter arrangement justifies this route. I don't know what that is, a ready-made shelter. But perhaps that's an explanation. So what do we learn from all this? Maybe nothing, maybe everything. The whole thing is just totally convoluted. There were rational technical explanations for many of Oswald's travels and incidences and events within the Soviet Union. And I think it's time that we need to sort of reflect upon some of the analytical explanations rather than just jump to all the speculations because of what we imagine spies' life and spying should be. Thank you. Thank you, Mark Zaid. Great report. I just want to add on to uh, Mark's remarks on the uh, fake defector program. I, uh, in the course of our research, I got to speak with Senator Schweiker forgot that. <laughs> Please go right ahead. <laughs> and uh, he, he told me something he wasn't able to say years ago at, during his, his subcommittee hearings uh, in the in early 70s. He said he was informed by CIA brass that there was indeed a notion to incorporate a fake defector program. It was never implemented. He swore to them he would, never make, he would not make that public because they assured him Lee Harvey Oswald was never considered for anything. He believed them. He they would not tell me the names of the CIA brass who, who, who gave him this information. However, I had, sent, I had followed up and f spoken to the executive assistants for both Bill Harvey and Desmond Fitzgerald, and they uh, indeed agreed with that. They had considered a fake defector program, but never implemented it. All right, our final speaker in this segment, we're going to take a break after our next speaker. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, be able to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Oleg Nechaparenko, the former KGB colonel, who will talk about uh, how the KGB dealt with defectors in both directions, how they viewed the entire subject, and how they viewed the Oswald defection in particular. Ladies and gentlemen, Oleg Nechaparenko. Sorry, but my poor English doesn't permit me now uh, to speak with you direct in direct form. So I hope, with the help of uh, Ludmila, to tell you some um, conceptions of our side about the factors and uh, maybe some special um, details about their our uh, thinking our. Uh, our vision of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald as a defector. Uh, maybe to answer for your questions. No, прежде всего я хотел бы сказать, что если бы 30 лет назад мне сказали, что я буду сидеть в Далласе. First of all, I would like just to say to you that if somebody 
30 years ago would have told me that one day I'll be sitting here in Dallas. И что я буду сидеть за столом вместе с представителем FBI. And that uh, together with the representative of FBI, I will be sharing one table. Я бы, наверное, задумался, что нужно обратиться за консультацией к психиатру. Maybe I would think that it's high time for me maybe to consult a psychologist about that. Но я думаю, что и вам бы, если бы такую картину нарисовали тоже несколько лет назад, вы бы задумались, может это произойти или нет. And I, I'm quite sure that 30 years ago, if somebody told you that it's possible, you will think twice before you believed it. Что касается проблемы предателей или дефектов, как их принято называть. So as far as the problem, uh, we, have, we can mention just um, terminology like maybe betrayers, or we can say, as it's usually used, defectors. То мое личное мнение на этот счет, которое разделяют и многие мои коллеги. So my personal opinion, which is being shared by all of my colleagues, что предательство или defection это высшая форма проявления эгоизма. So we agree that defection is a betrayal and it's a full implementment of selfishness. Поскольку человек, совершающий предательство, он предает не только свою страну, свою организацию, но, как правило, предает и своих самых близких людей. Because a betrayer not only betrays his country and his relatives, Нет, не his только country. страну, организацию, но и своих близких. Uh -huh. He doesn't betray only, not only his country and his organization, but he betrays uh, his close relatives, people he related closely to. And his friends. And his friends. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, sorry. Таким образом, из многих известных мне случаев предательства с обеих сторон, как правило, вот это присутствовало во всех. So, it, as far as to my knowledge, as all betrayers I knew, these elements uh, were there. С обоих сторон. From both sides. Но я думаю, что само явление предательства, оно зародилось вместе с человечеством. But I think betrayal was born together with the human being. И, наверное, с библейских времен, со времен Иуды и Скориота. And from the Bible, from the times of Скориота and Judy. Мы с этим явлением сталкиваемся довольно часто. We always, um, we always con are confronted by somebody who is a betrayer. Но предательство для специальных служб для разведки и контрразведки. But betrayal for professional people, for people who work in intelligence and counterintelligence. Это явление является одной из составных частей их работы. It's uh, I would like to say something which is a part, a consistent part of their work. Поскольку uh, как только, наверное, прекратится это явление перестанет существовать, так прекратится и в какой-то степени агентурная работа разведки и контрразведки. Because I think if the betrayal will stop, then there will be no need in services like intelligence and counterintelligence. Поэтому, когда мы говорим о предательстве, о defection, when we talk about betrayal or defection, Мы подразумеваем, что э, спецслужбы всегда, серьезные спецслужбы, они э, всегда имеют модель предателя из своих рядов и из рядов противника. Ну, 
model. No model. So I would just say that um, uh, usually when there is a betrayal, there is a, a certain model of, I would like to say, a pattern which is being followed in, inside the intelligence or outside it. Поскольку эти модели предателей из своих рядов и из рядов противника составляют одну из больших частей работы спецслужб. Because the model of this type of betrayal is one of the most important jobs usually intelligence service has. Поскольку знать потенциального предателя для контрразведки очень важно, чтобы предотвратить свою страну от ущерба. To know potentially who can betray is a part of a job because knowing you can prevent for counterintelligence. А для разведки выявить потенциального предателя с другой стороны. А for the intelligence it's important to clear who is the betrayer on the other side. Значит, получить доступ и проникнуть к секретам своего противника. Поэтому я думаю, господин Торнер согласится со мной, что здесь расхождений каких-то в подходах не бывает. So I would like to say that Mr. Torner will agree me that professional, this is the same approach all intelligence services in the world have. Что касается конкретно случая с Ли Харви Освальдом, as far as Lee Harvey Oswald is concerned, то КГБ, когда появился Освальд в Советском Союзе, KGB, when Lee Harvey Oswald first came to, write to the Soviet Union, не воспринял его как defector в оперативном понимании. I would like to say that we didn't accept him, we didn't treat him, and I would like to say that we didn't recognize him as a defector in our operative professional understanding. Questionary which he filled in in Helsinki before he came to, to the Soviet Union. Because when he filled in the form, he wrote profession, it was written a student. Когда он э, написал заявление о желании получить советское гражданство уже приехал. When he wrote an application where he expressed his desire to stay and become the Soviet citizen. Еще не было известна его биография. До we приезда. we didn't know before his arrival his biography. И э, получив официальное известие информацию из Верховного Совета. And when we received an official uh, confirmation and documents from the Supreme Soviet about his desire to stay in the Soviet Union, the decision was made on the fourth day and he was rejected. But after his attempt to commit a suicide, Вмешались другие организации. Other organizations inside the country were involved in the decision making. Которые опасались, что uh, отказ от марксисту и человеку, который хочет uh, строить новое коммунистическое общество, отказывают в этой возможности. So the refusal, the refusal to young men who try to confirm he is a Marxist and who wants to participate to build a communism, a socialism, will damage the reputation of the country. So the whole procedure was that information went to the Central Committee of the Communist Party about this man. And from there, from there на КГБ спустилось указание подготовить предложение по тому, как относиться к Ли Харви Освальду. And from there there was a recommendation to KGB to think it over again and to recommend how to solve the problem. И на мой взгляд, КГБ нашел в то время оптимальный выход. And to my professional opinion that KGB at this period of time find the best decision. Uh, было предложено разрешить 
Lee Harvey Oswald to live as you know, the decision was made that there was a permission for Lee Harvey Oswald to stay in the Soviet Union for one year. Within this period of time to study him, and in a year to reconsider the possibility of him being the, the citizen of the Soviet Union. Таким образом, настойчивость, с которой Освальд добивался получения советского гражданства и оставления в Советском Союзе, его заставила, загнала под контроль КГБ. So the uh, desire to stay in the Soviet Union, the Lee Oswald's desire, and he was insisting to stay in the Soviet Union, in a way he did it, put him under the civilians of KGB. In six months uh, of his staying in Minsk, he started to be disappointed he became uh, step by step being disappointed in the way the Soviet Union was, build, was building the socialism. And, and the same way is he was pushy to stay in the Soviet Union, the same way now he was pushy to go back and to leave the country. And he was smart enough to use chances and his status he had in, in the Soviet Union. So he, he started to talk to the Soviet bureaucracy saying that he's not allowed to leave, his, to leave the Soviet Union to return to his motherland. And at the same time, he applied to the American embassy and to the American authorities and he was asking for protection uh, from the American government to protect him from the Soviet government who didn't allow him to go back to his country and to, and to help him to preserve the rights of any American citizen that you have. Uh, Что касается отношения к нему бюрократических структур, государственных структур с обеих сторон, то обе эти стороны в этой ситуации, опасаясь политических пропагандистских неприятностей, относились к нему довольно мягко. So he was lucky now because at this period of time political situation was quite favorable to him and both sides, Russian, uh, the Soviet government and the American government were quite soft in uh, their decisions because they didn't want to have any type of political difficulties. So I would like to say that he was a headache for both sides. And both sides were trying to find the medicine, just uh, were trying to relieve the pain, relieve this headache. headache. Uh, I, would not, I wouldn't say that the status quo is something which is real, but it's my analysis, and this is conclusion I made studying different documents. Что касается, uh, был ли он агентом американской разведки в то время, или не был, стал ли он агентом советских спецслужб, или не стал, 
Я этот анализ излагаю в книге. As far as the question of him being agent, uh, or, uh, either CIA agent, or he was recruited by KGB, uh, I wrote about in, it in my book. Но я считаю, это мое личное мнение. But I consider, and it's uh, my personal opinion, что спецслужбы обеих сторон не рассматривали его как uh, объект, подходящий для The both intelligence services didn't consider him to be the subject to be recruited. Другое дело, что после его смерти, but uh, after his death, его образ, его личность, his его имя, his personality, his image, and his name, было использовано для взаимной борьбы на was used by both sides on the propagandistic level. So where both sides were trying to depict him like uh, one of the elements of a plot. Or they depicted in different times him as it was convenient for any for every side. И в результате я считаю, что до сегодняшнего дня очень трудно разобраться в том информационном пространстве за эти 30 лет, где там подлинные исследования и подлинные результаты. Результаты этих исследований изложены, или где результат акций специальных служб. So, and I, know, and I think by now it's very, really difficult to understand what the whole truth is, what really happened, what information is true, or which information was created specially because it covered in the interests of some intelligence services. За все, за весь этот период. For the whole period of time. Что касается uh, вообще предателей с обеих сторон, то у нас такой взгляд на них, у нас есть такое русское выражение, предатель есть предатель. You know, as far as betrayers are concerned, usually... Uh, betrayers are defectors. Uh, все равно. I just, uh, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, betrayers and defectors is the same word uh, Oleg is using. So, um, so he said that uh, a betrayer is a betrayer. It's a Russian saying. Да. И насколько мне известно, предатели или дефекты с обеих сторон, как правило, до конца своей жизни находятся под гнетом чувства вины. And as far as I know, betrayers or defectors, they always are always feel this type of guilt until they die. И часто это является причиной деградации их личности. And very often they degrade as human beings and personalities. И приводят к трагическому концу. And usually their life is tragic. Но так, чтобы э, вам больше не надоедать своими сентенциями. So that maybe it's not too boring for you to listen what I consider to be a betrayer or defector. Я хочу вам предложить небольшое сравнение I would like just to give you some type of comparison между судьбами двух предателей одного с одной стороны другого с другой стороны and I would like to compare two the life and destinies of two betrayers from которых, one side from American side and from the Soviet side и которых судьба в какой-то степени свела э, событиями в Далласе and these are two betrayers to defectors who by some chance uh, destiny brought to Dallas. На мой взгляд, вот те совпадения, которые привлекли мое внимание в их судьбах. So to my opinion, there is some kind of coincidence in their destinies and I would like to mention them. Носят просто мистический характер. And I would like to say that they're even like mystical. Я сначала попрошу Людмилу э, вот, перечислить эти э, параллели. So I would like for, uh, so to ask Людмила just to mention them from the piece of paper she has in front of her. А потом 
может быть, в процессе вы сами или поймете, о ком идет речь, или я вам потом в процессе назову их имена. So, and then I'll mention the names. So, uh, I think maybe after I tell you Parallelia. this parallel destinies, you'll guess by the end who they are. If not, I'll tell you the end. So, uh, the, all right, life of these two people is like, has in their biography, like the biography of two twins. Both were born in October, but on different signs of zodiac. Both served in the Navy. Both wounded themselves by revolver in the left hand. In the both destinies, it happened in October when both were 17 years old. Both were suspected that they committed, that they made, that they um, shoot themselves. One did it because he was afraid to go to the front and participate in the war, and the other one did it because he didn't want to serve in the army in a different place which he didn't approve. Both were punished. Both were stubborn to achieve the goal which was selfish. Both were very sadistic to the people they loved and care. Both became defectors. Both married foreigners. One married a Russian woman, the other married an American woman. Both had daughters. One was sentenced to death, the other one was assassinated. Речь идет о... No guess? No guess? Oswald and the other one? Right. Right. Correct. Это я так для того, чтобы вы могли видеть, что проблема предательств, проблема перехода от, с одной на другую сторону, она, я повторяю, э, стара как мир, и пока в перспективе, наверное, будет оставаться даже и в обозримом будущем. So I'd like just to mention that betrayal has historical roots and it's as old as this world and it's not it was a problem, it is a problem, and it's going to be a problem. Хотя сейчас, хотя сейчас, конечно, что касается обстановки в мире, то сложнее быть дефектором. Though I would like to say that nowadays it's more difficult to become a defector. Раньше можно было из одних окопов перебегать в другие окопы. Before it was possible to move from one world to another world. А сейчас неизвестно, где проходит what I mean was that uh, if you are like in a war and there are two fronts, it was possible to change. And if you don't like what is happening here, you can cross the line, fire line, and be on another side. Now it's difficult. And why it is difficult? Because you don't know where the line is. So, like, for example, I'm sitting now in front of you, so where is the line? No, maybe, uh удовлетворение эгоистических интересов найдет какие-то другие формы. But maybe this uh, type of ambitious desires and selfishness will find some other form of implementation. Ну, спасибо за Thank внимание. You. Oleg Nechaparenko. Thank you. Uh, we seem to be running a little bit ahead in our time schedule. What I think we'll do is take our 15-minute break now and then finish with our last two uh, speakers and then go to Q&A and some panel discussion. Thank you. See you in 15 minutes.